back. Again, here are my disclosures. So talking about the future, I think it's smart to first look at the past and remember where we came from in, uh, in intensive care. You can trace the origin of modern mechanical ventilation back to 1952 and the Copenhagen polio epidemic. In the first month, mortality was extremely high from respiratory paralysis. And they were treating patients in iron lungs like this. And then along came a smart anesthetist named Bjorn Ibsen, who said, oh, these, these elevated bicarb levels that we're measuring are actually an indication of bad respiratory acidosis. And we should apply a ventilator. So they did a tracheostomy and then had medical students at the bedside doing six hour shifts of positive pressure mechanical ventilation. And lo and behold, the mortality rate dropped precipitously. So we can pinpoint the exact date that we started modern intensive care and mechanical ventilation. And from then, groups around the world started re recognizing that bringing patients together in special units made a lot of sense because there was team learning that needed to be, uh, to be done. Uh, this is cut off a little bit here now because I, I didn't uh, fix this slide properly. But uh, this is a report from the Canadian Medical Association Journal from 1959 uh, outlining the first year's experience of the new respiratory care unit uh, in Toronto General Hospital uh, where I worked. And this is a unit that they set up thinking about polio, but in fact ended up looking after a lot of other patients with post-operative respiratory failure. And there are a lot of interesting learnings that we, in reading this paper, that are still relevant today. It was a multidisciplinary team set up with a, an anesthetist, a respirologist, an ENT surgeon, a thoracic surgeon to look after people together. They had dedicated nurses. And when you read the paper, they still had problems with not enough beds and too many patients, uh, it's the same as we have today. Um, interesting, one of, the, one of the founders of this uh, unit was Barry Fairley, uh, who just turned 91 last year. Um, and we were very lucky to have him back in Toronto for the 60th uh, anniversary of this uh, event last year. So we've gone from here to now our patients today. More machines than you can uh, fit in the room sometimes. The patient's awake on a, on a cycle, getting dialysis and ECMO at the same time. What's next? Where do we go from here? So this is one tool we use in Toronto, but it's not available everywhere. Niels Bohr, a famous uh, Danish physicist, said some smart things. He said, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. He also said something, you know, like, never express yourself more clearly than you can think. I'll try not to do that either. You can look, there's lots of papers written about what is the future of critical care. One by Gordon Rumenfeld, Jean-Louis Vincent, uh, Art Slutsky, Luciano. It's a bit of a guessing game. I'm going to spend 20 minutes or so talking about different aspects of what, where we can take advantage and how we can change things both at a system level and at a patient level thinking about respiratory failure. And we have challenges, and like, like most things, you can think of challenges and the opportunities that they, uh, that they present. Our challenge in Canada, and in many places around the world, I'm sure here in Mexico also, is that the critical care system is under strain. We have a limited number of intensivists, a limited number of beds, and costs are spiraling. We see these uh, American data predicting the supply and demand imbalance about the number of intensivists. And with the baby boom and, a, and an aging population, this is the predicted number of patients who are going to need mechanical ventilation using Ontario data, but similar things seen everywhere. So we have an increasing need. So that's a problem. What are the opportunities this presents? This really makes it behooves us to think outside the box and think about improving system efficiencies. We can plan change, we can think about virtual ICUs, regionalizations, network approaches, outreach teams. 
And we can also do things to adjust expectations, which is otherwise, otherwise known as the key to happiness. So when things are bad, that's bad, but it also can be helpful if you can use that to create a, a so-called burning platform and convince people that maintaining this status quo is more dangerous than changing, because change is always potentially uncomfortable or, or difficult. A strategic plan can help you, not so much because of the exact steps of the plan, but because by actually making the plan, you develop a team and get everybody uh, on board thinking about the right uh, issues here. And when you're trying to change, think about all the steps that you need to actually be successful. So you need a vision, but that's not enough. You need to give your team the skills, incentivize them properly, provide the necessary resources, and create a step-by-step -step plan of action to have successful change. Take any one of those steps out, and you can see here confusion, anxiety, only gradual change, frustration, or false starts happen. So regionalization, maybe we need to get better about moving patients around so that we can take advantage of the volume outcome relationships that we've talked about before. Here's a, uh, a paper from Jeremy Kahn showing clearly that there's a difference in mortalities in ARDS patients depending on how many a center looks after. We also can use sort of networks to implement best practices and improve care. A paper led by my, my colleague and friend Damon Scales here showing that a cluster of, of hospitals using central implementation to target things that we, that we think are good for patients like preventing DVTs and doing a daily spontaneous breathing trial was significantly able to improve practices. Similarly, expanding the, uh, the reach of the ICU outside of the, uh, the walls of the physical unit may be helpful. So all of these things might improve efficiencies in the future. And at the same time, I think we do need to recognize that not everybody needs or should have intensive care uh, at the end of life. One of my, uh, so here's a paper from, uh, from the US just outlining that actually dying in the ICU is pretty common. 20% of patients, 20% of people, of, dis, of people who die in the United States do so in, intense, in an intensive care unit. And many times, we as healthcare uh, workers feel like we're doing too much. This was quantified by uh, this group of European investigators showing that there was a disproportionate amount of care and most of the time it was too much care. Sometimes. Patients felt, uh, clinicians felt it was too little. But at least a quarter of, uh, a quarter of these people reported at least one case of uh, inappropriate care on the, on the single day of, uh, of this study. So that's another thing that we need to work on more as a, as a societal challenge. What about the quality of care and trying to provide the best, uh, the best care we can to our, to our patients? Well, here's another challenge that we have. Right now, we, a lot of the time, we end up so-called measuring quality by things that are relatively easy to measure, not necessarily those that are actually important. This is one of my favorite uh, papers I like to show to our hospital administrators when they get excited about our central line infection rates. This was, these are reported central line infection rates from four hospitals. Then these are the, and the, and the order is C is best, then D, then B, then A, but they're all pretty good. This is when you actually go to the, to the hospital medical record and look objectively to see who actually had documented infections, and suddenly the rates are like this, and up here is hospital C, which was supposedly the best one, which just means that a lot of these data are underreported or, or subjective. Similarly, ventilator-associated pneumonia, which we used to think was the scourge of intensive care, probably the attributable mortality from that is not as high as we used to think. So if those things that we can measure or report easily are not so important, what do we need to do? Well, we need to work on defining key aspects of quality of care 
that truly are associated with patient outcomes. And we have to recognize that our knowledge base is evolving over time. And things that we thought were true 10 years ago, today we might realize, ah, actually I, I was wrong. And we need to recognize that. Um, in Toronto, we're actually trying to collect a lot of processes of care in a, in a collaborative around the city that look at key metrics that we think improve, at least today, we think improve patient outcomes. Doing timely spontaneous breathing trials, using minimal sedation, uh, screening for delirium, getting people up and walking early. And this allows us then to give sort of audit and feedback data. These are data from six uh, ICUs around the city showing different rates of spontaneous breathing trials uh, in a, on a quarterly basis. So you can see we have some opportunities for improvement here. Another challenge is, is, the, uh, is the amount of fantastic amount of new science that we, uh, new science knowledge that we have, but actually translating that to effective therapies at the bedside has been a bit of a block, right? Taking ARDS for, as an example, this is an old uh, slide, but it still makes the same point. It's not from lack of trying that we haven't found things that work for mortality and uh, to improve mortality in ARDS when you talk about drugs. So steroids, prostaglandins, surfactant, uh, inhaled nitric oxide, ketoconazole, procysteine, lysoflin. The message here is the same. None of them work. But, is it, but I'll, I'll point out to say that maybe we need to be smarter about instead of giving one a treatment to everybody who we label with ARDS, we need to be a little bit uh, smarter about targeting our therapy, I think. Dave Sackett, who is one of the grandfathers of uh, clinical epidemiology, said, this is the only statistics that a clinician trialist needs to know, which makes me feel good. Um, and he says, the confidence or your ability to show an outcome is directly related to the signal, i.e., that is, the, si the true size or the true magnitude of the effect, times something like the square root of the sample size, but importantly, divided by or inversely proportional to the amount of noise in your signal. So this means, by noise, I mean you're giving the medication to people who it doesn't help uh, or that maybe it's even harmful or maybe they don't, don't even have the disease of interest that you're looking for. And we see this, this is also known as heterogeneity of treatment effect. So this is a nice analysis here by Jack Awashna in the Blue Journal of a negative RCT um, that showed a 15% relative risk reduction overall, but in some, there were some groups, you can see here that untreated is worse, untreated, sorry, untreated better down here, untreated worse up here. Looking at this another way, in, if, we, if we did the trial only in these patients, we'd have said, wow, this drug is fantastic, it works. Because we did it across everybody, we diluted that effect out, and we say, oh, the drug is rubbish, let's not use it. So we need to make periodic revisions to our syndromic definitions, gradually incorporating more basic science into them as we know more and can get that uh, to the bedside. And we also need to work collaboratively on large uh, international RCTs based on sound physiology, I think thinking about also alternative new technologies for trials, including registry trials and platform trials. Here's an example of a registry trial uh, from uh, Scandinavia in a, a trial in cardiology patients done in a cath lab. And this is just to make the point that this is the total number of patients who were undergoing a primary coronary intervention uh, in the centers participating in the trial. And this is the, all the patients who were randomized into that trial. If this were an ARDS uh, trial, typically this red line would be down here like this. It's a tiny fraction of patients who actually get into the trial. And the incremental cost for doing this study was only $50 per patient. So what about new stuff that's coming down the pipeline? We were talking about uh, these opportunities with, with ECMO and, and, uh, and the like. But I think there's opportunities for new monitoring devices electrical impedance topography, measuring extravascular lung water, PET scanning, lung ultrasound. These are all cool toys that we can start to play with at the bedside and figure out how to use them. I think we also need to be smart and realize that monitoring devices don't save patients. They only save patients if they're tied to some kind of effective therapeutic intervention. 
So we need to avoid the so-called PA catheter scenario where we put in and we get numbers and we don't know what to do with them and we may or may not make patients worse with it. What about new therapeutics? This is, a, this is exciting. There's lots of uh, R&D going on from both a drug and a device standpoint, novel ph pharmaceutical agents. From new, we talked about ECMO recently uh, before. What about uh, new devices, smaller ECMO, wearable lungs? Ult the ultimate uh, goal would be a implantable, like we have already have permanent left ventricular assist devices. Could we have a permanent uh, artificial lung that would obviate the need for lung transplant? That's the holy grail people are, change, uh, are chasing. Um, and I made these points already. In the last couple of minutes, just a, a few things about the challenges that unpredictable events happen. Um, unpredictable stresses to the system arise, which like pandemics and new disease outbreaks, again, in the time that they happen, can cause serious disruption and chaos, but can actually lead to very important change. So, for example, for us in Toronto, the SARS epidemic did this for us. Remember, this was uh, in early 2003. A, a patient uh, at the Hotel M in Hong Kong um, went to, infected several other people who went around the world, as illustrated here. It's amazing how much stuff you don't see is happening. This is happening every day and every patient um, coming out of this. This was our, we had several cases uh, in Toronto. This was uh, rounds at the Mount Sinai ICU uh, during that time and doing bronchoscopy. There's Dr. Lipinski we were talking about before. At the time, I was actually working in Madrid as a, as a research fellow, and the plane would arrive from Canada, and uh, everybody would break out their masks and uh, be very important. So, are you still worried about terrorists? Nope. Canadians. SARS spreads. Um, but out of this, out of this, crisis that we had uh, multiple ICUs effectively shut down with, uh, with SARS led to transformative change in the Ontario critical care uh, system. We now, from, just because of SARS, we now have a whole system where I can look online and see every bed that's available or, and what the occupancy rate is all throughout the, uh, throughout the province. Um, so we, need to, we, have to, we can work together at a global level. We've had partnerships between Canada and Mexico, for example, in, in helping uh, study H1N1 um, to prepare in advance for pandemics when or if, the, uh, if and when they occur, and still being ready to think about quantum leaps that do arise, whether they're penicillin or positive pressure mechanical ventilation. Groups like INFACT, uh, chaired by John Marshall, are trying to... Uh, foster this by bringing together trials groups and, uh, and people from around the world. Close up by thinking it's, it's hard to predict the future. It's a, it's a famous quote by Henry Ford. He said, oh, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster, heart, faster horses. It's hard for us to imagine the quantum leap of uh, hard to know what we want when it doesn't yet exist. I've tried to go over a few items like this and end um, and I'll end by saying, you know, sometimes the more things change, the more they stay the same. This is uh, on the left here is a physician caring for patients with the bubonic plague, and this is uh, somebody getting ready to go into a, into a SARS room. And we all think alike. No one thinks very much. Thank you very much.